Thank you for attending this webinar with Etienne. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent educational grassroots charitable 501c3 organization. Its mission is to educate small scale sideliner and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in-person and online presentations. We also conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. 2021 is our seventh year of collecting data. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year. Um, our website is nybwellness.org. Sent to you, um, Etienne, thank you very much. <clears throat> Sounds good. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, so my name is Etienne uh, Tardif. I'm uh, originally from Northern Ontario, but I live in the Yukon now. Uh, I got my start in beekeeping probably in 2004 in Northwestern Ontario. So North of Lake Superior uh, in a boreal forest environment. So most of my beekeeping uh, has been in uh, remote uh, areas like, uh, like over here. Uh, so yeah, so the presentation is you'll see I'll, I'll gradually get a bit more in detail. There's a lot of information on the slides. Uh, they're more of a guide. So you remember what I talked about. So I don't read the slides. I talk to the slides and it's so you have enough information to go back later uh, and actually understand what I was talking about. And I provided a PDF version of the presentation. So you'll get access to that when the, the video gets posted. So let's see the Yukon. Uh, so there's about 4,000 people or 40,000 people up here. So it's about the size of, I think, Spain or Sweden. Uh, so not many people, more moose than uh, people up here. Uh, we're next to Alaska. So it is on the Canadian side. Uh, I'll do my best with uh, Fahrenheit, but uh, sometimes I'll switch to, uh, to Celsius. Uh, so this is, for example, last year, my yard. So we typically get about, uh, I don't know, a couple of feet of snow to maybe four or five feet of snow. Uh, usually in colder areas, uh, there's less snow. Uh, so you can see the mountains in the distance. So these are the, the, the I guess, the interior coast mountains. Uh, Alaska is actually on the other side of these mountains. So we're on the dry, cold side of the mountains. Uh, and most of my beekeeping is done in this type of environment. So it's a mix of spruce, pine, uh, aspen, and willows. Uh, and the ground cover, mostly in the pine forest, it's all uh, lingonberries, so low bush cranberries, a few different berries, and a multitude of uh, wildflowers. So I'll uh, just get going. So basically, we're in. I'm in zone between one and two, so up here. Uh, and you can see how, so this zone two, some of you might have some zone three and zone four is most of New York. And uh, you'll see that most of what I'll talk about, uh, I'll go through basic management approaches because uh, I've got a saying is I manage my colonies all year round. Uh, with winter in mind. So everything I do is to make sure that they're set up for success. And then I do minimal uh, manipulations at this time of year. For us, fall is actually August. And the beginning of the season is May. Uh, and you'll see I do early season. So I do March things to, to give me a couple of extra brood cycles. Uh, just so you know my background, I, I'm an engineer, but actually I, I coach and I teach engineers and managers and leadership uh, on how to be more practical. So I do like charts, but I try to make sure that the charts have a, a clear message. So over here, one thing I talk about a bit about is uh, growing degree days. And the opposite of growing degree days, it's called heating degree days. And I'll, I'll show you a little chart on that later. So what I did was just to, to show some comparisons. So I'm outside of Whitehorse. So I'm slightly colder than Whitehorse, but you can see there's quite a bit of gap. 
and but we're able to have a, a decent uh, season up here and we're able to get a hundred percent to ninety percent of our colonies through winter and i i picked any new york location in wisconsin because i guess uh when you talk to the southern 48 uh, wisconsin is a place that's considered cold and uh, you can see what the Ithaca and Madison, the winters aren't very much different. They're actually kind of close. And you can see that in our short growing season, we have a lot more sunlight, so you can we can grow our vegetables. So on my property, we grow most of our veggies uh, and we raise chickens and egg layers. So just uh, on my bees, I've got uh, most of the forage up here, we're limited to uh, probably two to four colonies in any one location, especially in the, the very rural forested areas, because there's just not enough forage. Uh, and I'll go through some of the forage we have here and in places closer to town where there's a limited farming or some of the sweet clover, they can probably kick that up from four to eight colonies per location. And our only real commercial beekeeper up here actually runs their colonies on uh, forest fire burns. So two, three years after a forest fire. So there's big, uh, I guess, what's it called? Fireweed blooms. And on those, in those locations, you can throw 10 to 20 colonies per location. So, and they, they do get really nice yields. Hey, what is the definition of a growing degree day? Good. Uh, so this one here is what it does. It takes the daily average and then it does minus 10 degrees. So you can get these numbers at spark.com. So you go minus 10 degrees and then you get a number. And what you do is you add those numbers. And then what it does, it gives you a cumulative. So how much heat the area gets. So you can see in the beginning here, uh, you warm up a lot quicker than we do and then we sort of level out so this is where where the curve starts going up that's pretty much when the temperatures are below 10 degrees as long as this the steeper the slope the higher your temperatures are above 10 celsius so for your forage and understanding your forage and when things are going to bloom it's usually linked to growing degree days or and, and in a combination of moisture and things like that so if it's too hot, especially up here with the, the really little soils we have, uh, it actually damages the flowers and then we won't get a, uh, so we got hit by that heat wave, that heat dome that came through uh, Western US and Western Canada. And basically the fire we got burnt. So it was still blossoming, but it produced zero nectar. So that's, that's growing degree days. And for example, heating degree days, which I'll talk about is the reverse. So what I do is I look at all the temperatures below a certain temperature, so 10 degrees Celsius, and then I add those up. And then what it does, it, it tells me how the intensity of the cold. And for any engineers in the room, we use that number actually to design how much insulation would we use on a house, for example, and how much heating we would need to keep a home uh, warm. And so the things you use to, to design buildings and get an understanding comparing one area to another area uh, with insulation and so you can connect it to the climate. Okay, good question. Uh, so over here, so I call them cluster degree days. Okay, so I made my own figure and I based it on eight degrees. So anything below eight degrees, I add the numbers up and you can see me here. I'm at about 100,000 cold units uh, versus, for example, Mike Palmer in Vermont, he's at 36. Uh, Mike Bush uh, in the, the Dakota or Dakota somewhere is 22. And over here, I did a talk with uh, Frederick Maryland and they were at 7,200. So you can see that uh, most many areas they actually don't need to insulate but one thing I do recommend and I'll talk about a bit later is top insulation and it, it just helps thermoregulate the colonies uh, over here is again it's 
you'll see insulation is not just for the cold. It actually helps with uh, managing overheating. And over here, this is just the map of the US showing the heating degree days uh, for different areas. So the darker the colors, the more heating uh, cost those areas will have. And you'll see that these color patterns actually match pretty close with the, uh, the hardiness zones. So this is my front screen. Uh, I collected, I started collecting data about four or five years ago. I saw I bought uh, my first broodminder kit and I, uh, it was to understand my, my bloom cycle, my nectar flows, and pretty much the brood cycle and see when the bees were, were, were producing brood, when the queen started laying, when she slowed down laying. So I needed all this information to make the best decisions that I could and improve my, uh, my techniques. Last year, I went overboard and I, I put eight, I think it was 14 to 25 sensors in a double and in a single colony. And because I wanted to understand more and a bit more of the temperature profile, just one thing to note, this profile is an average, it's an approximation. I would need a lot more sensors in between to get a really clear picture of what the, uh, where the cluster is, but it gives me a pretty good idea of where it's moving. Uh, this was just to show, this is a wooden hive down in Maryland. So somebody had put sensors in exactly the same way I did. And I just calculated the heat loss based on outside and the heat loss when it was brood rearing was about equivalent to three pounds of honey per week. So I'll go through this in a bit, but the critical part for a non insulated hive is in in early spring when the queen starts laying and the brood nest starts developing. Uh, the enclosure actually becomes the critical survival because they. Uh, they'll start expanding and trying to heat the interior of the colony. In my polystyrene hives, so I use mostly polystyrene, right? Sorry, polystyrene hives year round. You can see that instead of point or three pounds per week, I'm actually at about 0.3 pounds per week. So I'll show you the numbers uh, that I've calculated over the last two years. And uh, my setup now is pretty thermally stable and efficient and it keeps the bees at that prime metabolic rate of uh, four to 10 degrees Celsius, which makes them consume the less. And one of my challenges is my winter bees are anywhere from 200 to 300 days old. So I need to make sure that they're not being stressed out with uh, heating the colony too much. Okay. So next one, basically, I keep eight to 10 colonies from, uh, I raise them from nooks uh, in mixed sizes, doubles, singles, and five frame nooks. I've got three bee yards. I've got two that I use to overwinter. And these are the types of poly boxes I have. Uh, I use carniolins. Uh, I buy Saskatraz and I raise my own queens uh, from local, from my own stock. These bee yards are completely isolated from any other beekeeper, so I'm, I'm completely standalone. And I've had one bad winter where I discovered, uh, I guess, honeydew honey. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. But also, uh, I'm a bee geek, so I, I invested in a microscope and I do my own microscopy on pollens and some of the diseases. So I, I self diagnose my nosema and I trend my nosema. Uh, here and there. So basically, uh, basically I had nosema. So I've, I've got a way now of understanding if the colony is going to have nosema and if it's worth spending the time to try to, uh, to, to prop it up in spring. Because usually it's, it's more of a spring issue for me with nosema. Colonies will make it through, but once they start brood rearing, the aging process kicks in and any bee that has been damaged with mites or with Nosema will die really quickly. And I use oxac oxalic acid vapor for my mite treatment. Uh, I do do some counts. Uh, sometimes I use washes. 
A lot of times I'll just do random OEV treatments with a sticky board and just see what my drops are. And then I've got a threshold that I use for that. Okay, and a Z question about the uh, polystyrene. Uh, what is the difference in severe temps between polystyrene versus other styles in helping keeping happy colonies? I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, it's basically just offhand, a basic polystyrene hive is about R8 value. So an R value of eight and a wooden hive, a three quarter inch, uh, I guess, pine board is about uh, 0.8. So one R. So in numbers, it's about six, six to 10 times more efficient heat wise in a polystyrene hives. And most of them come from Europe. And in Europe, they actually don't use top entrances. So top entrances is a North American thing. And without a top entrance, most of the polystyrene hives uh, have a really low consumption rate. And I'll get into moisture control and all that, and how I, I went through a journey of using top entrances, uh, using candy boards, uh, using quilt boards and all that, and basically coming up with what I have now. So most of my yards, or actually all of them, I use uh, pallets and for wind blocks. So we do get quite a bit of wind here. It helps with that. And the other one, it helps slow down any bear that would come towards my bee yard. And then it would slow them down and then they'd hit the wire and get zapped. So knock on wood, I've never had a grizzly or a black bear jam through my fences. I've got game cameras and I've seen grizzlies and brown bears or black bears around my yards, but they've never actually bothered my bees. So one big thing is, so I'm going to start at spring and I'm going to go to spring. So we're going to do a spring to spring journey in what I do. So these are pictures from last last spring. So not this spring, I have pictures of this past spring and I'll go, this is from a year and a half ago or almost two years ago. So one thing I do is I take a lot of pictures. I check my brood. I check the, basically I check the stores fairly quick. Any colony that's weak, I'll shrink it down into a, a single box or in a five frame nook. I add pollen patties and I keep it quick. So, this past spring, we had a minus 37, uh, I think it was April 27th. So it was an extremely late uh, spring this year. So my bees were hive bound until May uh, with no cleansing flight. So it was kind of tough. But you can see how my clusters, I've got really nice clusters coming out in March and April. And most of my pollen patties I actually put on mid mid-March, early March, mid-March, uh, probably a month or two before, probably two months before first pollen. And that's to give me two extra brood cycles so that I can get my colonies in May to be able to, mid-May to late May, to be able to split and actually get uh, our June uh, honey flow. And I'll go through how I feed that in a couple of slides. So one thing I've learned, so in my other career, I, I do failure analysis. I coach people on how to uh, observe problems in processes and how uh, the business runs. So I'm pretty big on root cause. And the big thing is it's about owning the failure versus blaming external things for why things didn't go well. So weather for me is not a reason for losing a colony. It's a, it's a symptom of your management practice, not being able to manage the conditions you're, you're, you're dealt with. So a lot of times it's a lack of knowledge, uh, not a consistent wintering approach. Uh, it's poor winter prep, not enough stores or there's wet stores. So if you do late feeding, uh, just so you know, I've never, my bees are pretty much high bound from uh, late September to late April, May. Uh, they don't really get a cleansing flight until maybe late March, if it gets warm. Uh, and basically that's, that's their, their, their high bound. So I have to make sure that everything is top notch or I may encounter uh, dysentery. I may have ice blocks underneath my colonies. Uh, 
So the key is to be observant and try to understand what caused it. So for example, over here, uh, this colony here, I'll show you had high mortality over the winter, which indicates nosema for me. And I'll, I'll show you why I say that in a bit. Uh, the bees were all in the top box, but the bottom box was frozen in. Okay, so frozen in meaning it's, it's like a nice dam. Because in the evening it still drops to minus 10, so like 5 uh, Fahrenheit, uh, probably 5 to 10 Fahrenheit every night. So it's still cold. So what I do here is basically I pulled the bottom box and then I made it a single. Because there's no point leaving this box here because they're just going to get hive bound and they're going to die. So there's little tricks and things you learn as you go uh, that it, it's how you give your bees a chance. Is there a minimum temperature below which you won't do quick hive inspections in the spring? Uh, I'll show you my setup. So usually it's about uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius is my threshold. That's what 45 Fahrenheit is my threshold. Uh, but in March, I'll show you how I open my colony up from the top and there's minimal exposure to the colony. So I've got a, a modified quilt type thing that I built on top and now it's just styrofoam with a little slot where I can put fondant or uh, pollen patties. So a bit about my hive management techniques. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over a couple of slides, not to, to make this a uh, three hour talk, but uh, you can see how I run doubles, singles and nooks. And basically I'm not stuck to any one method. I actually like overwintering singles better. Uh, so I think I've, for the last three years, four years, I've been doing singles on half my colonies and I haven't lost one yet. So that's about four colonies uh, a season and my doubles I've lost three and a couple in uh, in May or June, but uh, I, I just find it easier to manage easier to look at the brood nest, but this is just an example of how I manage my uh, my singles and move forward and uh, it's fairly straightforward. And that again is a talk in itself, but. Uh, I'd say don't, for non-insulated colonies, I'd just, I'd say be wary of singles uh, because your cluster has a lot less space to move in. So success factors, like I said, so I, I manage my bees all season with wintering in, in mind. I'll show you how I do my queen assessments. And one reason I, I give those initial pollen patties in March is so I can do a first queen assessment late April, early May during that first uh, warm spell when I do my first inspection. I tend to move any capped honey frames to the lower boxes as soon as they get uh, drawn out. So if I've got any heavy honey frames, I'll move them down along the outside edges of the bottom box. So manage your mites. Uh, key one is understand your local pollen flows. I'll show you a couple of slides. So I've actually mapped out my, my forage cycles my pollen and my nectar flows. And the reason I was having, so I've been keeping bees in the Yukon for close to 10 years now. So for the first five years I had, they were over overwintering, but my springs were really, really slow. And the bees would be ramped up for July, mid-July, which is one of our uh, nectar flows. But I wasn't, like, I wasn't aware that we had a June flow. But now with my new setup is my best honey is actually in June and uh, it's, it's just good. The other one is the number of bees to the hive enclosure volume is critical. So the more bees you have in your box, especially winter bees, uh, the better they'll overwinter because it means there's more bees. In my setup, the metabolic rate, so them just uh, resting metabolism, so not really agitating themselves, uh, they don't really cluster until probably minus 10 to minus 20, depending on how big the cluster is. So technically I'm not worried about my bees until it starts getting below minus 10, minus 15. So my average winter temperature here from uh, say mid-October to April, mid-April is about minus 15 Celsius. Where the cold is, last year we got minus 48 
was the coldest and we had about uh, a week of that of minus 40s uh, minus 30s and uh, so i have to make sure that my bees can withstand that and not burn out key one for me is another one is uh, a thermally stable home so when you use insulation that's what it does it helps maintain a, a more stable temperature as the uh, inside the outside temperature fluctuates it helps the bees keep that interior temperature stable. And the big one is don't shy out on stores, especially winter stores, because it's a thermal mass, it helps with insulation, and then it just guarantees that they won't uh, starve. So I don't pull any honey from my main brood boxes. That's to me a, a no touch. I only pull my supers, my honey supers, anything in the bottom boxes is untouchable. And I'll go through how I feed my bees uh, in August to get the top box uh, drawn out. There are a few questions about the benefits of slatted rack. Uh, I'll cover that in a bit. Uh, what basically what that does is I'm going to do a bit more data capture this year on it. Uh, but what it does, it gives me a, a thermal buffer. So I've got a histogram of temperatures above the above the slatted rack versus below the slatted rack and it gives like a, a five to ten degrees celsius uh, buffer from the outside temperature so it actually helps keep the bees away from more extreme temperatures but what i want to do is do a control study this this winter to uh to put it to bed like i said late april spring cleanup queen assessment uh, make sure there's honey frames and move them to outside positions. And this is just basically how I run things. So I, I move my honey frames to the bottom sides. Uh, later in June, any capped uh, brood on top, I move to the bottom for them to hatch out. And then I take eggs and larvae and I keep them in the top box, nice and warm up here. And what it does is as this hatches out, it pretty much coincides with when the bees need to start getting ready for winter. So it's just uh, an easier way to manage. Next one is again, late July is usually when I'll make the call, will I winter in a double, a single, or a five frame nook? I do weekly inspections. Uh, usually they're about five minutes long and I don't pull more than two, four, maybe five frames max. And it's checking on brood and general queen health and any uh, disease type issues. I do OAV in May, early May, and then I'll, I'll monitor drone and I'll monitor natural drop and I, I'll do some random OAVs over the season and I, I just monitor uh, the, the drops. So anything more than a 10 drop, 10, 15 might drop in May, uh, we'll get another treatment. Uh, anything over 50, uh, it's an area of concern, especially if it's two high counts in a row. So I've just developed a system now and I, cause I've let a few colonies in my isolated yards get out of control so I could actually see what would happen. And, uh, so now I've got, again, those, I know what happens if I do nothing and I've, I'm just building, uh, different treatment options to get the, the mites under control. But it's typically one or two colonies have uh, mite issues out of uh, 10, so it's not a, a biggie. A lot of times I'll prepare for splits in May, early June, uh, and it's to, to basically just before my nectar flow, it's to, to make sure they don't swarm. And towards the end of the summer, so I start trickle feeding a bit of uh, one to one and I'll, I'll talk about my feed strategy in a couple of slides. What is your scheduling of um, vapor treatments? So basically I do May and I do August. Do once you do I, every five days? Uh, yeah, I'll do once a week, okay. five to seven days. And for example, if I run it and I don't see any mites or I see just a couple of mites, I'm good. Uh, I'm not too worried about it, but it's when I start seeing the uh, the 20 to 50 range or higher is where I, I know they will, there's a lot of uh, hidden 
potential issues. The other thing to note is I'll, I'll typically do two back-to-back -back treatments in May uh, because the brood rearing is recently started. So sometimes you get a low count because the mites are all behind a, the first round of brood, so behind the capping, so they won't get hit by OEV. So I've had and where I did the first treatment, I had a drop of five mites. And then a week later, I did another treatment and I was up in the 80s. So that type of count worries me. It tells me that there's a lot of mites in the cappings and it just reproduced quite a bit. So those are observations that the more if keep, keeping note, keeping track of your drops, because for me doing a mite treatment without measuring how efficient it was is you're blind you need that information it's critical for you to know what the drop is so that you can build your techniques you can do washes you can do all that it's all great but for me it's was my treatment effective and you can do the wash before and after also so i'm not going to do anything on biology but just knowing you these numbers is critical especially when you're doing inspections uh understanding your your regional pests and diseases your pollen cycle flow for me this is critical for wintering is uh and i'll again i i feed pollen patties in march and i feed pollen patties late july early august and that's just to make sure i have healthy winter bees i've developed this management approach i took the idea from one of the I forget which beekeeping club is they had something similar and I took their idea and then I developed it for my my area so when I do my my coaching and my courses up here I, I teach. Uh, from overwintered colonies to installing a nook or a package and then just so a lot of people like a cookie cutter approach, but then I try to make sure they understand biology and key triggers. So that these are actually not time based but event based. This is my typical five minute inspection, I do two full inspections per year and they usually take me 10 15 minutes and that's where I pull every frame and I have a good look at them to make sure. Uh, things are going okay and those are usually late April early May, like I said, I pull no more than two to four frames i'm looking for brood the location eggs health pollen stores uh, i've got uh, screen bottom board so i look at that and it's fairly straightforward uh, because screen bottom board you'll see chalk brood you'll see different brood issues you'll see if the bees are hatching out you'll see fresh white wax as the nest expands uh, you'll see your mite drop after a treatment or your I, the natural drop might drop I found it doesn't really correlate well with your mite levels and for me it tells me I have mites yes or no and if I see mites more than a few mites in a natural drop in a week then I'll I might actually just run an OAV to, to see what the numbers actually are so a queen assessment I don't really like using that word but uh, or performance but it's important that as early as you can in the season that you know your queen is is top notch. So, like I mentioned before this first inspection I provided that colony with pollen patty. So what that does is it actually triggers within hours the brood rearing cycle. So I've got some data where I put the pollen patty and two hours later that colony went from a. a a high of 20 25 degrees Celsius to over 30 degrees Celsius and then maintained and then you can see that the uh, the area of that temperature grew so that tells me the queen they're starting to prep and the queen's going to start laying very shortly so by doing that probably three weeks before my first inspection is i'll be able to see every cycle of brood from the egg, the larvae to the to basically capped and I might actually see fuzzy young bees just emerging and and that's a really good way of knowing if the queen is laying because right now a lot of times if I don't when I, I used to do this I didn't do pollen patties so this I wouldn't know until the first natural pollen 
and I wouldn't get this information until June. So by doing March pollen patties, I know it by April. If I've got a sensor in there, I know it much faster. And then when I do my inspection, I can get a quick count of how many bees and the size of the brood nest. Uh, two, three weeks later, I do exactly the same thing. Count frames of bees, look at the brood nest, is it growing? If the answer is yes, then I'm happy and chances are that queen's gonna do well into June. So no need to requeen her right away. And then I'll do a final assessment and because sometimes they, they get a false start, they do really well, but then something happens and then uh, they struggle. So I do three assessments. And usually by this time, this is mid-May uh, to late May. And the queens, I can get queens out of Vancouver uh, flown up to, to requeen any of the colonies that I may have to. I'm looking for steady growth equals the queen is still good. If you've got the same number of bees or less, then chances are you need to requeen as soon as you can. Uh, because my season is so short, I can't wait for swarming because my season will be finished. So I just buy queens and it helps me bring fresh genetics in. And just so you know, I haven't bought bees in about five years. So I went from three colonies up to 10 to 12, 10, 8. So I tend to, to hover in the eight to 10 range and I create uh, maybe three to four splits slash nooks every year. And I try to bring in probably two, three, sometimes four new queens from outside and then raise two of my own queens or three of my own queens every year. Uh, I don't like using resources in my really strong colonies to boost weaker colonies. Uh, I may do it if it's a really good one, but I don't want to sacrifice my, my potential honey flow in June. So what I do is I give them feed, I give them a pollen patty, and then basically I, I, I wait and see. I don't want to put too much effort in those weak colonies. I've learned to, to know when to quit. So we're going to get into a bit of wintering stuff. This is pretty complicated. I could do a whole talk just on this one slide. Uh, but what I want you to understand is for good wintering, you need to make sure you got healthy bees, number one. Okay, so these are nutritional stressors, brood diseases, nocema, mite levels, uh, anything in your area that affects your numerous bees, making sure you have healthy uh, wintering bees. These blue boxes, these are things you can do. Uh, making sure your queen is is uh, top notch. Uh, and for me, for example, Nosema was a big issue. And I've learned to mitigate it and deal with it <clears throat> through, <clears throat> excuse me, through uh, some feeding. I do use Hive Alive in the late summer. I do a treatment to that. I do pollen patties. So my bees are healthy. So they tend to have lower nosema loads. And I make sure I don't have small clusters. The other one is the food one here is lots of minimum. I do 40 to 60 pounds of, uh, of honey or all in weight per brood box. Okay, so my main brood box, uh, a double will be about 110, 160 pounds, depending on how beefy it is. Uh, my doubles consume about 50 pounds of honey from October to pretty much May. I do very little feeding in spring because most of my feeding is done in fall. Uh, my singles consume about 30 pounds in that time period and my five frame nooks consume 10 to 15 pounds. So I always have a lot of extra left in spring so I don't have to worry about starvation. And the last one here is the enclosure. Again, depending where you are, how cold it gets, and how long those cold spells are, this is where you'd make a call if you want to insulate or not. Uh, I'm working on numbers for the summer aspect of insulation, but I'd say for now, I'm, it's not something I need to worry about or worry too much about here. But uh, I used to do top entrances. Uh, if you do, it's a higher energy consumption because it's, it loses a lot of heat. Uh, but you need to understand how moisture works and condensation works before you do that. 
uh, like I said, I just use a small lower entrance with an open screen bottom board that's protected. And that's my, my main wintering approach. And I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. And just so you know, a typical cluster will release five to 20 watts of energy. And in my case, it looks like they're releasing about eight watts of energy at minus 15 degrees outside. And it, that's their, their balance point. If it starts getting colder than that, then you can, you can see that they're, they're kicking up their, they're, they're agitating, they're, they're shivering their muscles a bit more to produce a bit more heat. And they're not in a tight cluster until it drops to minus 20, minus 30 maybe. So it's, uh, they don't get stressed out too much over winter. So nutrition and bee health, these are for me, but I'll say know when your nectar flows are uh, because it's critical to make sure that the queen keeps laying. So sometimes we get a dearth, especially the midsummer one. So if, if basically like this year, the flowers get burnt out, uh, I can just pull my, my supers mid July because I know there won't be a, an August flow. And I'll just trickle feed one to one to make sure that the queen keeps laying. And I might just throw a pollen patty on there to make sure the queen keeps flowing. Uh, the other one is honeydew flows. So I know there's a, was it a spotted lantern fly or something down your way? Uh, up here, it's, it's, it's mostly aphids and sap sucking insects uh, on aspen, poplar, spruce, and pine. But uh, if you do have honeydew in your honey, just learn to recognize it. It's really good for humans, but not always the best for the bees because the sugar content, the simple sugar, so like the glucose or fructose and the honeydew is typically a lot lower than a blossom honey. And there's a lot more stuff, so ash content and minerals that the bees can't really digest effectively. And there's a lot more complex sugars that the bees require more energy to break down. So what it does is it, it uh, they need to consume more to produce the same amount of heat, uh, which fills up their guts a lot faster. And in my case, I can't afford that because they don't get a cleansing flight. And if they don't get a cleansing flight, they'll poop in the colony and then they'll start cleaning. And then all it takes is a handful of bees with Nosema. And then I've got uh, a collapsing colony with uh, Nosema issues. Uh, most of this mapping of all my local flowers, I did while walking my dog. So basically look for bees on flowers. My, my path where I walk the dog walks through some, some flower meadows. I would just bring my iPhone, take some pictures, uh, identify the pictures. Was there a bee on the flower, the color of the pollen of the the uh, of the pollen of the bee on that flower so it just gives me an idea of most likely color that pollen so it took me a few years and then i uh, bought a pollen collector for 20 bucks on amazon and what it does it just gives me my proportions of different types of pollens at different times and yeah i won't jump into more detail here and what it does is Basically, it identified a gap in late July, early August, where it's low pollen time. And then since I started feeding fall, so August pollen here, pollen patty, uh, basically my, my clusters are healthier. They come out of winter much, much uh, nicer and bigger. And it's easy to get them to brood rear. And I have less issue with nocema. Yep. There's a lot of questions about your pollen, pollen patties. Do you make them or do you purchase them? I use global patties, just uh, not the, I, I'm a small, I buy maybe 20 pounds of it a year, 20, 40 pounds of it. And I use the 15% or the 55% real pollen. And uh, the reason I buy that is because it's a Canadian company out of Alberta, support local and Basically, there's no other real supplier up here, and we can we group purchase uh, for the beekeepers in the Yukon, so we help lower the costs. But uh, nope, it's global patties, uh, fifteen percent or fifty five percent, and overall, I'm happy. And then, literally, if the bees aren't taking it, it means they don't really need it. So, if uh, 
I won't add another pollen patty if they haven't touched the old one. But over here, you can see that the queen, so this, these, this blue and orange line, this is 35 degrees Celsius. So that's the brood nest temperature. And you can see as first week of August, it started dropping. So it tells me that the queen is slowing down. But then I was like, no, 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 it's too early. Because if the bees are, are born in August, it makes a really old winter bee. So what I do is I add pollen patties. So this was a reactive action on my part. Now I just give pollen patties over here. Okay, I don't even mess around anymore. I just throw a pollen patty uh, late July, early August. Every location will have its, its peak point here. It's a low point. And then that's up to you to decide. But for me, it's here. And now the line keeps going. As long as I put a pollen patty, it'll stay flat. And then it'll, the queen will stop laying once. Basically, I pull the loss. I, I tend to stop early September. And that way, those bees hatch out at the end of September, early October. And it drops significantly the age of my, my winter bees. And because there's nothing left here. And the other thing is, I, we get a lot of rust spores on fireweed and willows here. And when I wasn't feeding pollen patties, the bees were all over the, the rust spores and collecting this orange dust, pollen-like thing, and bringing it into the colony. So for example, yeah, there's none in this one, but uh, I'll show you an example later. And again, the key is to make sure that the queen keeps laying throughout the season. So during hot, dry spells, uh, I tend to throw a pollen patty in there just to make sure the queen uh, keeps laying and the bees have a, a protein source or a lipid source. It's a fairly quick one. So for me, Nosema is the other challenge is you can see it's all green, so it's all fireweed pollen uh, in late August or early August. And there's a lot of research out there saying that polyfloral pollens are much healthier for the bees because they'll get a nice balanced diet. So this is another reason why I do pollen patties is to add some mix in just a pure fireweed pollen. And the other one is rust spores to manage my rust spores. And the other critical risk is wet honey stores because too much moisture. So if you read some of the uh, Randy Oliver's uh, articles, there is a link with excessive moisture management, dysentery. And I've noticed that dysentery leads to nosema versus nosema leads to dysentery. Okay, so it's more of a vector. It's a, uh, a pathogen ve vector. This is just really easy numbers to crunch. So if you want to know how old your bees are, just try to figure out when those bees were raised and then go to your first pollen and it gives you an idea of how old those bees are so if i waited till may you can see that some of my late summer bees because uh, some drones actually tough the whole winter here and some of these bees are almost 300 days old and up to 250 days old but by feeding a patty early in march what i do is i actually cut it down okay and if I extend the brood rearing into September, I cut it down some more because this is really old for a bee. Okay. So let's see. So these are the reasons. And over here, these are all the reasons why the lifespan of a bee would be reduced. Okay. I'll, I'll briefly talk about uh, disturbances. So you tapping on the colony has an impact. And I see it in a polystyrene hive because it's so well insulated. So the actual heat generator stays in the colony for three to four days. But in a wooden hive, you tap it, that heat dissipates almost instantly. So it actually doesn't get captured. So hence the reason why it may not seem like there's an impact, but there is. So lack of food, poor quality, metabolic, metabolic aging is the bees consuming honey to produce heat actively ages those bees okay at some point some of these heater bees will age out and a lot of times those are the bees you'll see out front of your colony because they've reached a point and 
they're altruistic. So if they're still alive, they'll either die on your bottom board, or if it's not that cold, they'll go die outside. Uh, there's cold stress, there's some diseases, uh, nosema, viruses. The thing with nosema, because it affects the gut, it affects the nutrition and the energy that they're receiving from what they're eating. So it has a pretty bad impact. And up here, I see mortality, increased mortality in nosema. And there's a reason I see it and probably why you don't see it down there. And I'll show you why in a moment. And then there's all these Varroa things. And then there's the life that's left. So the more you manage the, these things up here, the longer your bees will survive. And the better they'll be in a position to raise that first brood cycle in spring. Chances are we all have mites. And the key is just keep your eyes open and don't think you don't have mites. Uh, up here, it's usually take, it usually takes three years before a colony. If I do nothing with the colony, it'll take three years for that colony to get to a point where I get PMS and viruses showing up. So I do have a bit of leeway, but I rather just manage it every year so I don't have to, to worry about that. Uh, and I do use, I'll start using, so I do have a few medium frames in my deeps, and then the bees draw out uh, usually drone brood below. And what I do is when I go inspect, I'll just scrape that off, and then I'll go have a look at those drones to see how many of them have uh, basically mites in them. And this is an example of me pulling one. So you can see there's the foundress. Uh, this looks like a male, so it's smaller. And then there was actually five of these light colored baby mites in that one cell. So you can see that one foundress can produce sometimes two to five new mites in every cell. So it can get quite extreme. So this is my my varroa so again spring i do two treatments five day spacing and it gives me a pretty good idea of what that colony will do so if i see a high count then chances are there's a problem uh, if i see lots of drop and some of my random checks bring up uh, high levels then i'll do uh, i started using formic pro this year but i'll probably look for another one but because uh, it's tough on the bees in the wrong uh, condition uh, and then I'll do for sure another one in August, and that just tells me what the levels are. So has it gone exponential or is it still flatline? So this year, one had went exponential and the other eight, I guess, were flatlined. So it's, uh, and then this one here, I did another Formic Pro to try to knock them down. So I've got four years of data for here. So like I said, I do my microscopy. So I take, I look at, because it's so cold here, and I'll show you, I put a, a piece of plywood in front of my colonies to control when they cleanse. Most of the bees die out front, okay? Pretty much on the landing board. So if I see a high level of dead bees, and I usually take a walk or snowshoe to the colonies once a month, and then I'll just take a picture of the landing board. So if I see this, and I've got four years of examples of this, it pretty much it's high infestation. So the majority of these bees have nosema and they might have these other cysts and different types of uh, uh, diseases associated with, uh, I guess, high mortality. And over here, if I see very few bees, usually it's nothing to worry about. And then I have colonies that the whole winter, there's hardly any dead bees out front. So, and a nosema colony also makes a lot more noise because they need to generate more heat, eat more, generate more heat. They're less able to thermoregulate efficiently. So I find my nosema colonies a lot louder and wetter. Because the thing is, the more honey you consume, the more water you need to manage or the bees have to manage. So in a nosema colony, one, they're unhealthy, they're consuming more, they can't thermoregulate, they're generating more moisture. So in my climate, it, it spells disaster, okay? Just on the rust spores, so for example, there's um, some brassicas or the yellow, the 
black stuff, that's the fireweed. And then there was all these red balls in there. So, it, and it's the rust spores off of our wild roses and the bees once these bushes, especially after the first frost in, in August, just get full of it. And the bees collect it like a pollen and they bring it back. And this is just an example of a bee gut showing these spores and a lot of the similar things in the, the dead nosema it's a bee is the same that i'm seeing them collect so uh, it's not a cause but it's an observation that shows that these spores are in there and then if i analyze my honeydew honey because i bought myself a centrifuge so i could do my honey analysis i see a lot of these spores in my honeydew honey and it matches up with this so all the dots connect so on feeding, so hopefully you know that, especially if you're a new beekeeper, it's important to, to feed those new colonies, especially if you don't have any drawn frames, because the first year is all about drawing wax. Late spring, I might put a, one of my top feeders, because my polystyrene hives have a really nice top feeder, and I'll put one to one, and it's, it's more to encourage the queen to lay more vigorously than to actually feed them because typically i'll have four or five really good frames of honey left in spring uh but uh that's that because i find she'll lay better if i have some liquid on than if i just rely on uh, my honey stores in fall like i mentioned earlier i'll uh i'll do about a gallon of one to one with a full dose of Hive Alive, just use the label. And I've actually been using ascorbic acid, so the vitamin C powder, so with no other additives, just pure ascorbic acid. And th there's research out of Europe, I think it's out of Poland that I've been following. Uh, and it shows, it helps with uh, mite resistance. I'd say just, if you want links to those papers, just let me know. Uh, but what I do, what it does is it brings the pH of the syrup from a seven to about a four, uh, which I, I don't think it, the, the research on that says it doesn't make a difference. It probably doesn't. Uh, but what it does is it, uh, there is a link between ascorbic acid and, and some overwintering success. Uh, once that first treatment is done per colony, then I'll just do a trickle. So I'll start doing two to two or sorry, two to one a uh, couple liters, uh, half gallon, and then I'll see how quickly they take it. If they take it down instantly, uh, then I'll, I'll just go to bulk feeding right away. But I don't want to go too quick, okay? Because if I go too quick, they're going to backfill the nest and take away space for the queen to lay. So hence the reason I do two trickle feeds, uh, usually spaced out uh, once a week, so that I'm not bogging down the, the nest with syrup. And, and then pretty much the last week of August, early September, I'll do a, a maybe like a two to four gallon feed of thick of uh, two to one. And basically that's for them to, to finally fill the backfill the brood nest and for them to have really nice thick uh, honey frames. In winter, I don't do any candy boards anymore. I do have a bit of fondant on it, but it's more to cover the space and prevent heat flow than to, to actually for emergency feed. Oops, it's quick. Okay, so let's do this. Oops, my hand was touching the thing. Okay, so just practical application of having really heavy honey frames is what it does, it, it actually pinches the top of the frames. So it creates a choke point and it makes it easier for the bees to choke that off and actually manage the heat in between frames versus an empty frame like down here if you've got empty frames i tell people take it out and replace it with a follow board like a styrofoam type follow board and the other thing what it does is when it's around a brood nest it's a thermal mass so the heater bees keep this area warm and the heat makes its way to this honey and it helps slow down fluctuations on that on that brood so imagine on a on a box level what it does is it actually slows heat loss and it makes for the bees to, to manage the environment better. 
So for this situation, I think I have an example in two slides. So again, healthy fat bees. So if you have got really small clusters in spring, chances are it's your winter bees aren't strong enough. Okay, or there's something else affecting the health of your winter bees. Uh, winter stores, don't be shy. And a dry home to spend the winter. So to help manage, because not all the places have really good uh, propolis flows. So what I do is I tape all my seams with Tyvek's tape. We call it uh, Tyvek tape here, but uh, or tuck tape here, but I think in the US it's called Tyvex tape. So it's the tape you use for vapor barriers. And this for me is a good population for a, a single or double. So a double, this is what I look for in, in a double. So if it's a bit less than this, it's not bad in my, in my polys, they'll do fine. But a colony like this uh, means that they won't cluster till minus 20. But a lighter colony will just lower that, uh, basically the clustering point may be minus 10 because they just generate less heat as a mass. Like I mentioned, this works for insulated colonies is in my climate where it probably double to triple how cold it is where you are, I can overwinter a five frame nook. Okay, so I'll show you how I set that up, but uh, usually early August, late July is when I make the call. Will I do a double, a single, or a nook? And what I do is I'll show you, I use a medium or a deep box, an empty one, and I put styrofoam in it. And what that does, it, it makes an ultra insulated cover. So most of my tops are, are 30 to are 40 because most of the heat loss, a lot of it happens through the roof. And by doing that, what it does, it, it actually pushes the heat down further. And by pushing the heat down further, it means any condensation will happen lower in the boxes. Because I'm telling you right now, at minus 45, you will get condensation in any box, regardless of how much insulation you have. This is just an example of reducing the size. Uh, this was, I think, a, it was a late split, so I actually did it in August because uh, I had to requeen. I had an extra queen. And see, this is fairly light. Luckily, the colony next to it had a few. I actually had six, like seven brood frames. So I stole one that was fully capped and a month later it looked like that. So I gave them an extra, an extra frame and you can see how there's a, a wooden follow board here and a taped up uh, styrofoam follow board here. So you could use this in a wooden box very easily to help reduce your space and it would actually help you uh, increase the R value. Because I found consumption has nothing to do with how much honey it's again number of bees to the volume will determine your your uh, consumption rate and versus how much insulation you have okay so the reason i put these wooden boards now is it helps with uh condensation and the bees dying along the side here because wood absorbs uh some moisture or condensation uh where poly and styrofoam the the water trickles along the walls and if there's any bees there they'll get sogged up and they'll die so since i started using these uh these pine boards so it's a one by ten pine board and i just trim it to look like a frame uh most of my mortality on the edges have gone and uh it's just an easy way of uh, of shrinking the size So for a single wood setup, so this is one of the people up here. He's got, uh, I think, three to four colonies. He's been beekeeping for six, seven years, and he has yet to lose a colony. Okay, so typical Langstroth boxes. He'll flip this, this cover over so that there's a small top entrance. He does use a top entrance. I'm not against top entrances in the right situation. Uh, this is two inch blue board and he tapes the seams and he actually keeps it on year round now because uh, he found he gets better honey yields and the brood nests are nicer and healthier all summer long because you're just less stressed. So he just slides that on top. He's got this screen that he uses 
and then he puts a burlap bag full of wood chips. He'll probably have to change it once in the winter. Then he puts another piece of two inch styrofoam and then he has his co top cover with uh, two inch styrofoam. Okay. And then the outside of that, he puts bubble foil wrap and then he tapes all the seams up. So the bubble foil wrap is twofold. Uh, in my climate, we don't want solar, we don't want the sun to affect the cluster. Okay, because it might be minus 20, 25 outside. And if the sun heats the outside of that colony, the cluster will break or do stupid things. So this, this bubble foil wrap is to reflect any solar energy. And also it, it makes a really good windshield. So it, 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 it prevents any infiltration of wind in the colony. And you'll notice that he shrinks down the lower entrance very significantly. And I'd say if you use a top entrance, I would recommend you use a solid bottom board. I don't recommend top entrances with a screen bottom board because then you'll get too much flow through ventilation. This is my typical setup. Uh, I usually overwinter four, five colonies together, two, three. And you can see where I put my five frame nook in the middle. I tape all the seams because that's usually where the condensation happens is you've got air infiltration that goes in. So cold, moisture air, and it hits the warm air inside. And that's where the condensation happens. So by putting the tape, you're just giving the bees a hand and they don't have to propolize as well, especially if they can't find the propolis. Uh, down here, you can you notice how I've got a medium box here. And I put two, so this is four inches of styrofoam on top. And I've got this feeder tray. And the next slide, I'll show you what this looks like. And then this is an example of the pine board. And a lot of my boxes, I run nine frames. It's a 10 frame box and I just run uh, them with nine frames. I use, then this whole unit gets covered with bubble foil. And I tape the top. So it becomes like a big, bubble and they can share heat between each other and they're protected from the wind. I get a cold north wind this way. So this is why I just built a little shelter around it. Uh, I do add an additional, you can see a piece of styrofoam here, two inch. I do add an extra two inch styrofoam on this wall, the back wall and the side wall. And I do a lot of my own reno. So I've got a lot of building supplies. But uh, basically, since I've done that, I two years now, I haven't lost the colony. I've lost one to Nosema in May, uh, but I haven't actually lost a colony in winter. So the other thing is, you can see the plywood here. So I protect my, because a lot of people are worried about the bottom entrance getting plugged up. In a wooden hive that's not insulated, I'll talk a bit in a couple of slides about ventilation. Okay, so in a non insulated hive, excuse me, the temperature inside is almost the same temperature as outside. So natural ventilation needs a temperature difference. Okay, in a wooden hive, you don't have a temperature difference. It's pretty much the same. So the only way to get flow through is with a top vent. Uh, but in a, a well insulated colony, you'll get a, a very significant inside and outside temperature difference. And that's what drives ventilation. So the bees don't really have to fan anything. Because when the bees are in a cluster, they're not able to fan. Uh, so dark colors are good, but in polystyrene, they don't make a difference because the insulation negates any of that uh, temperature difference, the bubble foil wrap. So this describes what I just talked about, okay? Because sometimes the surface temperature of the colony will be 10 Celsius, but the air temperature will be like minus 10, minus 15. So you'll get all these bees dying out front. And the other thing I can do with these boards is I just flip them down and then it gives a, a landing area for the bees. So this is that tray I was talking about below four to six inches of styrofoam. Uh, this was actually late April, so we had a really late uh, spring this year. 
but you can see I get a good eyes view at the, the cluster. I can see if they've actually consumed the sugar cake that I left there. So now I've, I don't use sugar cake anymore, I just use fondant. I buy a pack of fondant and I just stuff it in there to plug the hole. I've replaced these wood chips with just two inch styrofoam because they don't do anything and it's a heat loss. So now I just have styrofoam here and I have fondant here. And in March, this is how I pop the, the lid, have a quick look, and then just put a pollen patty on top here, one pound pollen patty. And then within a couple hours, they're getting ready to start rearing brood. Uh, like I said, I'm isolated. So what I do is I, I have a few of these bucket feeders and bees have nothing to do when there's two feet of snow. So on my deck, it's nice and warm. The bees are flying anyway, so I might as well give them something to do. So th they can start bringing back some, uh, some light sugar syrup, which helps with the brood rearing. Uh, one thing I started doing over here, for example, you can see Sharpie marks. I actually mark my frames as I'm inspecting. So for example, in inspection, you can see C, I think this was a, so, C was, uh, it was pretty much app empty, so comb. And then as I inspected it to brood, brood, honey, uh, it's when I go back in one week. So what I might do is I'll inspect this way. So I'll count five frames. I'll inspect these five frames. I'll write what they are. And then 10 days later or the next five days, I'll inspect this way. And then eventually, just for example, I, because I put BBB, I don't need to keep notes. I'll be able to see if the nest is expanding and then I'll, I could put a date on there. If it becomes a C is cap, not cap brood, but it's drawn comb. Uh, I can just put a B on it in a B because this one here, a week later, the nest had grown by two frames, which made me really happy. And you can see how I center my clusters they tend to shift one way or the other so what i'm looking for is a nice stable nest so what i did is i shifted some frames around so that the, the cluster would be in the middle of the, the box so this the next few slides are a bit technical uh, but it's to give some of you more advanced folks uh, food for thought again these are observations uh, they're based on uh, engineering concepts around buildings because uh, I don't think a call or a hive enclosure is much different than a building it's just scaled uh, but uh, in an insulated colony the temperature inside is proportional to the R value but in a wooden box with no insulation it's actually proportional to the outside temperature so I've got two years of data with the R value not the R values but the regressions and all that uh, that proves it and the other thing is a lot of my clusters are more hemisphere shaped versus the typical round or spherical clusters. So a hemisphere has less surface area than a, a, uh, a, a sphere cluster because the R value in a lot of my walls are higher than anything the mantle of the cluster can accomplish. Okay, so a lot of times I'll actually see the cluster hanging on the west wall and it will just be a a round ball against the side wall here so that tells me that they're actually using the r40 or 20 on the side wall for to be part of their cluster insulation basically it's about slowing down heat transfer that's all it does okay so in a wooden hive with the top entrance you'll get flow through uh, if you don't have any top insulation, a lot of times that's where you'll get your condensation because heat rises, hits a cold surface, and then you get droplets. And then wisdom says, lean the colony forward so that everything leaks out and doesn't fall on top of the, uh, the cluster or the leakage in the bottom leaks out the front entrance. I can't do that because it'll freeze solid and I'll have big blocks of ice. Okay, so uh, if you've got a, say, a wooden hive, but with extra poly insulation, so blue styrofoam, and you use a, uh, a top entrance, nothing wrong with that. Uh, make sure you've got good top insulation, 
more top insulation with even uh, R5. So one inch insulation on the side walls for most places in the US would be plenty. Uh, and yeah, solid bottom board. And what it does is you, it's just the colony will not. So I've got some, some time-lapse cluster movements for a wooden hive in Maryland. And you can see that every day the sun comes out, the, the colony actually goes towards the south wall. And when you use tar paper, the black stuff, it's actually to promote that so that the cluster breaks and it has an opportunity to move into the honey. Okay. In a well insulated hive, there's another mechanism. And uh, it's actually the heater bees just generating enough heat to heat the inside with no disturbances. It's, it's actually quite interesting. My setup is basically a screen bottom board. Uh, it's like a crawl space. So there's no, it's dead air down here. So it's stagnant air, but the moisture flows down here. My condensation points are typically in the bottom of the box. And actually most of it just flows outside the front. Uh, only when it's minus 40, minus 35, do I get uh, ice buildup, but uh, it's, it's not too, too bad. And I use a lot of top insulation because typically 25% of the heat loss is through the roof with all the sides being the same. Uh, that's because heat rises and chances are it'll find infiltration points and the heat will get out. Uh, so this was Derek Mitchell. So anybody who knows insulation and colonies, he's got a few papers out and he had shown that the colonies in an insulated colony, pretty much this means that they start clustering at 10 minus 10 wooden colonies. It's around 10. Okay. So, and this is just to show that at minus 40, so you can see the coldest temperature inside of this box was minus five at minus 40. Okay, and I think it gone down, uh, this was in 2019, I think it had gone down to minus 49 that winter. So you can see that the challenge with our weather stations is they have a minimum of minus 40. But you can see most of the temperatures are in that nice zone between five degrees and 20 degrees Celsius. And then over here, these are the temperatures where they start brooding later in the season. This was last year. Uh, again, it's just a, because there's a lot of naysayers about insulation and what it does. Uh, in the wrong context, I'd say insulation could cause more problems than help. Over here, this is just to show that in this red box, the, these these sets of like the gray, the yellow, the gray is in the middle of the cluster. Yellow was on the east side and the west side of the cluster. So you can see most of the temperatures are above 10 degrees Celsius. And usually the outer mantle, and this is the temperature on the outside walls, okay, just on the inside of the outside wall. So it pretty much spans the whole box. And then this blue here, for the folks who had asked about the slatted racks, this light blue, this is the temperature above the slatted racks, below the center of the cluster. And then the dark blue is the sensor below the slatted rack on the bottom board, just inside the, the entrance. Okay, so you can see how it does provide a, a nice buffer there. Temperatures over here, this anything around minus 20 and up, minus 15 and up, this is where there's active heating. This is where the bees are actually generating heat. But you can see that my bees spend most of the winter, because my average is about minus 15, just resting, doing what they have to do, but not stressing out. So they're not aging here. Over here, the heater bees are aging. This is just a histogram of my outdoor temperatures. So you can see the average is around minus 20, minus 15 Celsius. Uh, the coldest last year was minus 48. And you can see the warmest was, this is until April, late April was pretty much five. So there's not much cleansing going on there. Uh, the hottest temperature in the box was around 21 to 
basically 21 degrees. And that, that, uh, that fits with what uh, the studies say. So 20, the, the core of that cluster when it's actually not brood rearing is around 20, 18 to 20 degrees. Uh, the coldest temp in my single box was 8 to 11 C, so 46 to 52. So this, these are the temperatures on the outside of the box. Uh, the average temperature, again, 61 to 65. And then this is the key one here. The temperature above the slatted rack is actually from 0 to 10 C is pretty much the whole winter. Okay. That's the optimal temperature for the metabolic rate of our bees. Okay, and that's that's why my bees only consume 50 pounds in six to seven months of winter. Uh, and that's that curve, because a lot of these studies were based on outside temperature because they used wooden colonies and it was always comparing inside to outside and this ambient temperature is should actually read uh, temperature at which the bees are exposed to okay because it doesn't apply to a a tree hollow or a a, a well insulated colony this chart has to be modified a bit this curve still applies but uh, it's not based on outside temperature almost done uh ventilation just so you know, I talked a bit about earlier is proportional to temperature differences. In a non-insulated type colony, the difference inside and outside, especially after brood rearing stops, is very low. So the bees are forced to fan to move air. So to desiccate the, uh, the honey, to cure the honey or the, the sugar syrup in fall, they need to do exercise to, to move it okay more so than in a well insulated colony uh, in winter negligible movement because the cluster in the wooden colony is it's cluster driven so the the safety mechanism or the survival mechanism of that cluster or those bees is them forming that cluster and that's how they stay warm and protect themselves in my insulated hives for 90 percent of the winter it's actually the hive body the enclosure is their mechanism only when it drops to minus 20 or minus 30, 35, minus 40, do they actually start clustering like a, they would in a wooden colony. Now that's for the winter. And in the winter, the key is to manage moisture and high energy output equals more moisture to manage. Over here is just to show what a comparison between air change. So in, a, in my colonies, every two hours to eight hours depending on the temperature theoretically there's an air change meaning all the air gets changed out there's a lot of people worry about co2 and all this type of stuff in insulated colonies just remember co2 is a byproduct of uh, metabolic or like processing the honey to produce energy and every pound of honey that they consume uh, it's about three quarter cup of water they need to manage. Okay, so lower what, consumption. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, what effect does high CO2 in the hive on uh, longevity of winter bees? So there's actually positives. It, it would have to be extreme to kill the colony because uh, there's links to high CO2 helping the bees go into that, that, that zone, like a, uh, not a coma, but a an optimal zone because it reduces their metabolic metabolic rate so it it, it, it pretty much calms them down so a lot of times uh, when they're manip like scientists and stuff manipulate queens they'll they'll actually dose it with co2 to pretty much ne not neutralize but knock her out so she won't move around okay so i think when they're doing uh, artificial insemination they use co2 uh, the other one is there are some early studies around potential benefits around mites, uh, but it super high levels, it'll kill the colony. But what I've proven here, just by looking at the numbers, and it's just, and especially with my screen bottom board open, I'm not worried about CO2 being an issue. Uh, and, okay, um, one person uh, asked, 
how can we calculate the side and top insulation required to have the condensation towards the bottom of the colony for different climates? So, for example, I use because it's you'll have what's available at the hardware store. Uh, I think it was came in Reynolds last week. Uh, I think he'll try five. So a polystyrene is, I know there's people down in North Carolina. He's got some numbers. I'll try to get his numbers, but he uses the same polys as me and he does really well. So I'd say anywhere from uh, one inch to two inch, two inch is probably overkill for a lot of folks, but, uh, and one thing I encourage people to do is to experiment. Okay, so if you've got a system that works, keep working it and maybe tweak it on one or two of your colonies to improve it. And that's what I've been doing every year is tweaking one or two aspects of my wintering uh, to, to get to great clusters in spring and get more honey in June, because that's my goal. Uh, but it's, it's experimenting and tweaking things as you go. Uh, and I'd say start with five and do not do exactly the same thing with another. And these shells can be used year round. Like I said, the one beekeeper here keeps his shell on year round now, because uh, he's just seen the benefits on the brood rearing and he gets probably, so if he gets 20 pounds of honey on a wooden hive, he'll get 25 to 30 pounds of honey on the insulated one. Remember, our climate is much colder in the summer, so the bees technically have a higher heating load here because we'll get down to zero to, to between zero and 10 uh, almost every night of the summer here. So uh, the insulation helps us on that front. Uh, but you also see how there's a lot more ventilation in the top entrance format. OK, so for each of these curves, so for this is the heat loss curve of the top entrance and that's the heat loss or the, the, the liters per minute theoretically in a top entrance in a colony because uh, the challenge is there's not much of these studies have been done because it's it's really not a, uh, a biology project or masters it's more of an engineering mechanical engineering type of master's project uh, University of Guelph I'd say in 2011 had a couple of engineering students do a couple of uh, these type projects and it was great, but there's not enough. So if you've got a young one in your family who's a mechanical engineer looking for a thesis type project, ask them to look on uh, to do stuff on beekeeping. Uh, this is just observational proof of what goes on. So this is a minus 40 or minus 30 morning and you can see the hoar frost. This colony has no top entrance, so all the ventilation, all the warm air is coming out the front. You see the same thing here, and then this is in summer. Okay, so I'm crunching some numbers right now around when polys dry out, evaporate the honey best. Uh, in a wooden hive, it seems to be in the afternoon when it's warmer outside, but in a poly, uh, the best evaporation seems to happen in the morning when it's the coldest, and I'm hoping to to put something on BL uh, in a couple of days on that. And these are convective, natural convective currents, just based on the temperature inside and out. Because most of my colonies, you can't even hear them. They're, they're, they're quiet. Uh, and you get this type of, of flow. If you do use top vents, like I said, I'm not against it. I just, <coughs> excuse me, just manage your bottom entrance. And from a modeling perspective and from uh, when you design buildings, one danger is if you've got too many windows upstairs and you've got an open door in the bottom, <clears throat> when the wind is strong enough, you'll actually get a reverse flow. So in the prairies here, <clears throat> this is in northern Saskatchewan, they actually, this is just a piece of cardboard that they staple on their top entrance and it's to prevent the wind from blowing inside the, uh, the top entrance and uh, they get really good success and i've seen good success with top entrances and without top entrances so it's it's not a either or it's what works best and once you get your system going it, it's that's the key but i have a feeling consumption of honey stores is lower uh, when you don't have a top entrance because that's just a, a heat energy thing 
Uh, this I'll leave it for you. So this double here, this was that Frederick uh, Maryland numbers, okay? Based on how much insulation or basically how cold it gets. Because from the survey I did before the talk I gave to them, most of their colonies actually consume more honey in their three month winter uh, than I do in my 210 day winter. Okay, so these bees have a lot of moisture to manage and a lot of feces to manage because they're consuming a lot of honey. Okay, so it's, uh, it's a lot of, it's pretty much the same amount of cups. So they have to manage 38 cups of moisture in 90 days, where mine have to manage 38 cups of water in 210 days. So you can see that, hence the reason moisture is no longer my issue, uh, which is good. Uh, this again, it's just some thermal images. These seams, this is where condensation happens. So that's why I tape them now. Uh, moisture is just vapor in the air. It hits a cold surface it'll condense out. So that temperature at which it condenses out, that's called the dew point. And we know warm air rises. And like those pine boards that I use inside my boxes, it's all to reduce the impact of some of these things. Uh, if you did do insulation, like a, a two inch board, a styrofoam on your colony, I'd say, especially without a top entrance, most of your condensation would be happening, happening in the lower section of the bottom brood box in the UK and Northern Europe. Uh, the reason they don't have moisture issues is most of them use green bottom boards in the winter and it's to manage again, any drippage of, of, mo or of water in the colony drips out the, the screen bottom board. And the key with this screen bottom board in winter is to make sure there's no drafts. Hence the reason mine they open up in a dead space, like a crawl space, and it's just a drainage point. And maybe emergency air if ever that uh, front entrance got plugged. All right, uh, this question, do you see any effect from global warming that has or may impact your beekeeping in the near future? Uh, the, because I'm insulated year round, uh, no. Uh, more on the forge side, uh, because the what it does is any thermal variations outside are really buffered by the, I guess, the insulation properties. Uh, we are getting wacky weather up here where like we got 35 C, so 95, 98 F this summer when that heat dome came, we never get that. And it, the bugs are like freaking out, the birds are freaking out, the animals are freaking out, nature is just drying out. Luckily, it was only for three, four days. But where I see it is the variability of the weather is, is crazy. So th this is where my insulation helps. It, it helps buffer out those, uh, those extremes on the hot side or cold side, if that makes sense. So if you do set up for example, a single box, you'll see condensation will be on your corners. Okay, because that's the coldest point because your cluster, your, your core bees will be in the middle and then you'll tend to have things in the corner. So, and then same here, if you do, like, like I recommend people to, to, to push their colonies together so they share a wall because it reduces the exposures. If you do that, then the coldest point in the colony actually becomes the lower corner of that outside wall and uh, what that does it, it helps you manage moisture or condensation and where it should flow and you can see in this case if i've got a screen bottom board underneath here it'll just flow down there this is an example of a heating event so over here it was actually minus 45 okay so the i've got sensors every every middle. So I had nine sensors, one here, one here, one here, and there, and then below the cluster. You can see the thermometer there around minus 48. Uh, so the temperatures, they just spike up. And then the whole box heats up for a couple of hours. 
uh, the bees probably, they have full go of the whole box, so they can go anywhere they want. And then 24 hours, three days later, it's back to, actually this is 24 hours later, it's, it's pretty much back to normal. And again, it's minus 32 and you can see the box, the cluster is really not stressed. The coldest point here is 9.9. .9. And these are actual, so they're not estimated values. So these are actual values of nine. And even here, it's four degrees, 3.5 in the corner. So, uh, and you can see the interval is incredible. It's like clockwork. The interval between here is like almost exactly the same. So bees are really interesting. So I still have to look at the energy here and what goes on, but uh, during really cold periods, the bees are actually able to heat the colony. But in a wooden colony, they can't. So that polar vortex that hit uh, Texas this year, uh, the challenge there is it, it was actually quite long. And a lot of them bank on the sun to actually do this. So heat up a portion of the colony so the cluster can move around because it heats up the front surface and then the cluster can move into honey. But if it's cloudy for a week and it's cold, then that cluster stuck where it is and that's where they say it'll die an inch from honey because it can't move. And the reason you need that black tar paper is not for insulation, it's actually to give those bees a chance to move around during the sun to, to access the honey. Okay, it does help with the wind, but it's more for the sun. And I rather my bees be able to do this at minus 45, 40, and, uh, and then come out normal. And you can see these temperatures are fairly stable. And you can see how my weather station hits a bottom here, and it actually dropped much lower. This is just an example of me doing my experiments on my colonies last winter, tapping on them, uh, just doing things, and you can see how they spike up. And some of these spikes before they go back to normal are anywhere from two to three days. And the reason I see them is because the heat doesn't go anywhere, it stays stuck in the colony. And I think I'll leave it as that because the rest becomes very technical. Okay, so, I, I have a question about the, uh, the polystyrene hives. Um, someone has used Paradise and Lysen hives and both seem to be about one quarter of an inch more shallow than wood boxes. As a result, the top of the frames in one box are often propolized tightly to the bottom of the frames in the box above. This makes the poly boxes more difficult to pry apart than wood boxes. Is there some purpose to this that I don't understand? Or has the manufacturer maybe not translated their equipment to Langstroff dimensions precisely? So I've got both of those. So the paradise boxes, the top of the frame is flush with the, with the edges of that box. But below the frames, there's an extra three quarter inch. So they put their B space below the frame. So using a poly box, a paradise with a standard length trough, like those wooden boxes, doesn't work really well because they'll do exactly what this person said. Uh, the license is like a wooden box. So the license have the half inch above the frames and the lip, there's actually a gap there. So. It's one thing I don't like about the paradise boxes. Uh, they don't have, a, I have to make my own shim to give my pollen patties below the feeder. Uh, and I've talked to them, but uh, they don't seem to understand. So hopefully at some point they give us uh, the opposite, but no, it's just the design. So that's why the paradise doesn't mix well with typical wood or the license. Uh, paradise go with paradise and I think the new license are like the uh, the paradise boxes they're flush on top but there's extra an extra half inch in the bottom so the frames don't touch each other so I'll, I'll look at the Q&A so if yeah just ask away now uh, okay can you talk more about how you use oxalic um, vaporization mite drop to estimate the mite load, do you have a formula for an estimated colony population compared to the mite drop from uh, oxalic acid vaporization? Uh, there's a few 
papers, but there's a website called www.mitecalculator.com. So if you go OEV Mite Calculator, you'll see that they actually have a, an online calculator there where you put what your drop is after 30 hours. And then you give an estimate of what your B numbers are, and then it'll give you an, an estimate of what your infestation rate was before and after. Uh, and I found that a couple years ago, and it's, it's again, an approximation. Now that I've done it for the last four or five years, I've got, I know what numbers associate with what. Uh, but, and then for those with polystyrene hives, the way I do OEV is I actually do it through the screen bottom board. I put a piece of plywood underneath the colony. I tilt it over, slide a piece of plywood underneath, and I put my wand underneath the polystyrene, and I shoot upwards through the screen bottom board. And I put my t-shirts or my, my towels all around to seal it so that basically the whole box gets uh, vaporized. Okay, someone wants to know what is a slatted rack? A slatted rack, eh? So it's got the same dimensions as, let's see if I have an example. I guess I'd need to put one in there so people can see it. Yeah. So this blue styrofoam, I insulate mine. So this blue styrofoam, what it is, it, it actually looks like this. Instead of being frames, it's anywhere from two to three inches uh, wide or thick. And it's got these bars going across. Okay, usually in the front, you'll have a about a one by four width uh, plate. And then you've got these bars going out. And what it is, it, it creates a dead air space. Uh, and it, I find that in the summer, the benefits I see is it, I don't see swarm cells. It reduces the amount of free space between that bottom frame, especially in the polys, between the bottom of those bottom frames and the, the solid bottom board or the screen bottom board so that if most of my swarm cells are actually in the top box, which is really nice. And the other one is it creates an air buffer. And so the bees have an escape from basically having to deal with uh, super cold air. And then what it also does for me is the brood nest uses the whole frame because there's no cold spot in the bottom of the frame. So basically a slatted rack. So it's a bunch of probably three quarter inch bars, wooden bars going across with a flat bar there. So if you Google it, it's pretty self evident. And what I'm trying to do is just see if it really makes a difference in winter for me or not. Uh, do, do you have any problems with um, oxalic vapor and poly hives, any melting or singeing? Uh, no, because I run it underneath. So it never comes in contact with uh, polystyrene. So literally in the back of the colony, I put the one in the back underneath the screen bottom board and I shoot up and there's a piece of plywood. So it's, uh, it, uh, I never make contact with the, the styrofoam. Okay, if you're using solid bottom boards, what size bottom entrance would you recommend? Uh, most folks here do a maximum of three inches by a half inch. Uh, if you use a top entrance, then you can probably shrink it down to two inches. Uh, and the one thing is, for example, this entrance here, that's the pretty much, yeah, it's about two and a half inches, three inches. And if you look at the, this one here, uh he's got an inch probably three inches worth of entrance here okay ice damming have you noticed any ice damming on the bottom board uh, when using solid bottom boards without upper and upper ventilation uh i've never done that there's two other beekeepers here that have the same paradise boxes and they leave their solid their screen in or sort of their their insert in so they don't actually use the uh the screen bottom board and they don't have an issue uh, uh, back to the slatted racks um someone asked are they made of styrofoam no they're made of wood and what i do is i add uh, one inch styrofoam all around 
to uh, to basically reduce the, the heat transfer. Okay, do you recommend the use of insulation board versus natural insulation such as burlap? See, burlap absorbs moisture. And that's the challenge with a lot of the, the more traditional materials is they'll absorb moisture. And once they absorb moisture, they lose all their, because the problem with that, those wood chips, if I just go back to the wood chips. So these wood chips, in my previous setup, before I put this piece of plywood, there'd be ice in the top of these wood chips. Okay, so then spring comes, you got these soggy wood chips that don't offer any thermal protection. So I've just gone away from that. And I just put uh, poly in here now. And there's a canvas underneath. So the bees can actually chew the styrofoam. Because uh, this gray stuff, styrofoam that I use, the bees just love chewing it. So I have to protect it from them. Now, someone does ask, um, how do you decide when the wood chips need to be changed? You touch them and they're wet. So, and one reason is, that's one reason I went away from it. So last year I didn't change them at all. They were a little bit wet. The, the underneath was nice and dry because there's a constant heat, uh, but the top was a bit soggy and you can see how it transfers moisture onto this piece of plywood. This is just quarter inch plywood. Uh, one good side because I had an extra sheet and you can see there's moisture on here so that's the moisture flowing through the wood chips and then hitting the plywood and then likely dripping back and then at a minus 40 you would freeze on top of here or just stay moist and then do you have much swarming in your environment it took me six years to get my bees strong enough out of spring for them to be able to swarm so now I'm at risk of swarming in May, let's say end of May into June, where before, because they'd be peaking in July, the bees are like, no, too late to swarm. So they would never swarm. So now I've got uh, swarm cells in May, mid-May that I can use to make my, uh, my splits. And then I just use swarm cells for my, uh, my queens. So I'll, I'll leave two, three swarm cells on a frame and then just pick a nook pack it with bees and then just put it in one of these yards and then the queens mate and I mate for eight so I've never lost a, a, a virgin queen so they've always mated and they've always lasted two to three years easy so I've had to get rid of them versus and they, they're still good so nope, I've got one that's going on four years and not sure if it's the environment but and this that's usually each yard has two genetics they're never the same genetics they, they have different lineage. So that way, at least they're getting mixed drones. They'll probably, there's probably a bit of inbreeding, but most of it is actually probably the opposite colony that's mating them. And I maintain three yards, so I can actually move that mating nook to a different yard if I had to. Uh, someone asks, should I insulate under my solid bottom board? Uh, I would say yes. And I used to do it, but with a right now I insulate that the snow insulates my my crawl space. But I did insulate my my solid board and my my thing uh, because it's it's losing heat from underneath too. Especially if you want to avoid ice, then insulating that the bottom of that solid board will prevent ice buildup. Okay, top entrances. Um, is is it? Five eighths auger hole, or is it a notch on the inner cover? I like a. I forget what the area is, but uh, maximum three quarter inch. I'd say max three quarter inch. Uh, and the reason, say at an inch, you get about a hundred percent more flow through ventilation before the the air throttles out than you do with three quarter inch. So, and then it becomes too much. So the bees have trouble managing one inch, like anything over three quarter inch, I think the bees have challenges managing the flow through air. So, because sometimes they propolize these holes, but if it's too big, they won't be able to propolize it. Or it won't jam up with ice. If you get a really cold period, they, they tend to hoar frost and freeze over. Uh, and that's a defense mechanism. 
So if it's minus 40 out and then it's, it's plugged, it's plugged for a reason usually. Okay, could you briefly explain how you microscope your bees for a disease study? Uh, I think it's, there's a video, I think, on your website, on your YouTube, but uh, basically I take 25 bees, dead bees out front. I put them in a Ziploc bag or in a, a vial. And then when I get home, I, I add, uh, I think it's a mill, a mill or five mils of water. I can't remember exactly what it is. And then I squish up, I macerate them, I agitate it really well, and then I just use a, a dab stick, put it on a slide with the cover slip. And uh, that's my nosema check, and I follow exactly the same procedure for every check. So instead of counting like uh, nosema counts, I just see a basically a, a concentration. So I, I'm doing more concentration than actual counts. And then a lot of the other things is I, if I don't know, I'll, I'll share on a couple of different websites to see if people know what it is. Uh, Randy's helped me a few times identify foreign objects. Uh, and I'd say it's, yeah, mostly nosema, uh, rust spores. And now I'm learning how to do pollen analysis and uh, honey analysis. Yeah, so they all have entrances and uh, it's, so this here is probably because it's the back side. So this is the north side, so that's why you don't see an entrance on this one. Because the entrance is on the other side. And you can see here, there's a shim. That's my pollen patty shim, but now I've got a bigger one. I just converted a inner cover with uh, some styrofoam to make sure it's insulated. And that's where I do my pollen patties. This box here, that's that feeder. And, uh, and if you do brood minders, what I do is if I go to the next one, I've actually, I cut these tabs now. So right now it's just a sensor and I place it right in the middle and I don't have these tabs because any of these tabs sticking out is a place for the air to come in. So you can see there's a bit of mold here. Uh, so, and you can see a bit of mold here. So those seams, those are the seams that I'm taping and the sensors actually brought some cold air in. So now I just cut this off and uh, I don't have to worry about those condensation points. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I feel free to contact Etienne, um, check his website, um, email him. And um, Etienne, thank you very much. No problem. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Sounds good.